2020 marks the first year for a while with no new Star Wars on the big screen. Instead, it marks the big screen return of another major sci-fi property, namely Dune. Too many, myself included, director Denise Villeneuve's adaptation of Frank Herbert's celebrated sci-fi masterpiece is the most anticipated movie of the year. But many are also nervous, because will Dune do its source material justice, or will it too pull a rise of Skywalker and turn out a bloated mess? We are about to at the very least get an indication, because I have received some exclusive insights from a source with ties to the production. In this editorial then, I will begin by briefly recapping what Dune is and why you should care, before relaying to you what I have been told of the production, and whether or not there is reason for worry. Finally, I have some news that those who enjoy the editorials on this channel may find of interest. Dune is a science fiction media franchise that originated with the 1965 novel Dune by Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert himself wrote a total of six novels in the Dune series, which was later completed by his son Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. They also expanded the universe by writing a whole host of prequel books. But on film, it's all about the original novel. Set in the distant, distant future, amidst a feudal interstellar society, in which various noble houses control planetary thieves. Dune tells the story of young Paul Atreides, whose family accepts the stewardship of the planet Arrakis, also known as Dune. While the planet is an inhospitable and sparsely populated desert wasteland, it is the only source of the spice melange, a drug that extends life and enhances mental and precognitive abilities. This makes the spice the most precious resource in the known universe. Even faster than light travel is dependent on it. Since the spice can only be mined on the planet Dune, control of it is a coveted yet dangerous undertaking. The story explores the multi-layered interactions of politics, religion, ecology, technology and human emotion as the factions of the Empire confront each other in a struggle for the control of Arrakis and its spice. Alejandro Jodorowsky famously spent years setting up a Dune movie that ultimately never came to pass, and humanity is all deported for it. It is, without a shred of doubt, the greatest and most influential movie there never was, and we will have much more to say about it and its influence in later videos. What did end up made, though, was David Lynch's Dune, a notorious bomb released in 1984. It had a great cast and some truly stunning designs, but ultimately, its special effects were subpar even for its time, and the movie fell apart in the editing bay, in no small part because of producer Dino De Laurentiis' insistence that it could be no longer than two hours. For more of Dino De Laurentiis' misadventures, with some Dune references thrown in, check out our Ultimate Conan the Destroyer retrospective. That should hold you over until we release our Ultimate David Lynch's Dune retrospective. Next, Dune was the subject of a Year 2000 miniseries by John Haddison. With a running time of five hours spread across three episodes, it is story and script-wise spot on. Where it falls short is in the design department and overall production value, since it was made on a TV budget 20 years ago. Still, that did good enough to warrant a follow-up miniseries, Children of Dune, which covered two more of Frank Herbert's books. This, then, brings us up to today and Denise Villanueva's Dune. Filmmaker Denise Villeneuve was already acclaimed for his earlier movies like Sicaro and Prisoners, when he took the sci-fi audience by storm with Arrival and then with Blade Runner 2049. When he was announced as the director for a new Dune adaptation in 2016, after a decade of false starts with other filmmakers, fans were ecstatic. He seemed like the perfect choice. Later, 
he was also announced to direct the premiere episode of the HBO Max spin-off series Dune The Sisterhood. So the powers that be at Warner seem to be going all in. For the movie, Villeneuve has assembled a cast which is nothing short of epic, featuring, among others, Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, or Harkonnen, because that name is Finnish, Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto Atreides, Thanos himself, Josh Brolin as Gurney Halleck, Dave Bautista as the Beast Raban, Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho, Javier Bardem as Stilgar, Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica, Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides, and Zendaya as Chani or Chaney. The movie looks set to be epic, and it comes with an epic price tag. What is more, Denise Villeneuve has made it clear he sees the first novel adapted as a two-parter, of which only part one has so far been filmed. If there is to be a part two, part one kind of has to deliver, and for that to happen, it has to be good. So, what is the word from behind the scenes? Are there any rumors that should give cause for concern? Before we move on, please note that what I'm about to relate to you is information that was relayed to me by a source with ties to the production. I am not at liberty to disclose the source, which means that none of what I'm about to say can be independently verified. As such, you must consider this as rumor and take it with a grain of salt. Just like you were told to do with all the Rise of Skywalker leaks, which later were proven to have been accurate all along. With that health warning out of the way, let's dig in. First and foremost, I haven't heard anything to indicate there have been any kind of production trouble of note, not outside of those that occur on any major feature film. So as of now, there is nothing to indicate meddling or compromised visions of any kind. Speaking of visions, I hear that Villeneuve appears to have found inspiration in the look of David Lynch's feature film, which I don't mind one bit. Never mind that the special effects on that movie weren't all that. The designs themselves were terrific, and I would welcome a look inspired by them. Here it should be noted that Villeneuve did the same thing with Blade Runner 2049, where he used Ridley Scott's aesthetics from the original movie as his foundation. In the aftermath of Disney Star Wars, especially The Last Jedi, Many in the fan community are worried that Dune will take a turn for the ideological and go woke, if you will. I have been told that the movie will place a greater emphasis on the Bene Gesserit sisterhood, meaning Lady Jessica will have an elevated role. And she can do some pretty wizard stuff, as can all the Bene Gesserit. But this is for organic purposes rather than ideological. You see, all the great houses of the Landsrad or Lansrod, that's a Norwegian word, are connected through the wives, concubines, and daughters, all of whom are Bene Gesserit, or Bene Gesserit witches, as they're called by their detractors. They are the connective tissue which opens up the entire Dune universe, and that is what we'll see in the HBO Max spin-off series Dune The Sisterhood. Also, one character has been gender-bent, and compared to earlier adaptations, race bent. This character is Imperial Plantologist Dr. Liet Kynes, previously portrayed by Max von Sydow in David Lynch's 1984 feature film, and Karel Dobry in John Harrison's 2000 miniseries. In Denise Villeneuve's Dune, Dr. Kynes is a black woman. The actress has been cast and the performance has been filmed, but she has, as of yet, not been announced in the role. It is my understanding this was done to facilitate the casting of Zendaya as Chani, or Chani, who is still the child of Keynes and a Fremen. In short, anything that can possibly be construed as woke is done organically and for story purposes. It is my understanding there will be no ideological iconoclasm. Finally, I have been led to understand that the movie ends with Paul fighting for control over the Fremen, so just when things are really getting good. So far, there is still a year to go, but at this time, I have heard nothing worrisome come out of this production, quite the contrary. 
Everything I've heard so far makes me even more hyped for Denise Villeneuve's Dune and its Bene Gesserit spin-off series. I sincerely hope it earns enough to warrant not just the required part 2, but many more sequels after that. But Dune is still a year away. We have something else cool for you right now. For some time, we haven't been giving our supporters enough exclusive content. That is about to change. Some of you can't stand the sound of my voice, which is fine. Others can't get enough of it though, and for some reason even wants me to narrate audiobooks. The latter of you are in luck, because starting from January, Midnight's Edge will be beefing up our exclusive content for our backers, both on Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube. Everyone who pledges $10 per month will be treated to the monthly Beyond the Edge podcast, in which me and the others will detail the history and ups and downs of running a YouTube channel. While everyone who pledges $15 per month will be treated to me narrating the myths and legends of Thor, Odin, Loki, and the other gods of actual Norse mythology. I'll also add some of my own commentary with thoughts and interpretations along the way, and that should be a treat for those of you who follow the work of Graham Hancock. There are other rewards too, so don't wait. Check out the links in the description, sign up right now, and you'll be learning of both Norse mythology and the behind-the-scenes drama of this channel in no time. And in any case, be sure to let me know how excited you are for Dune in the comments.